All right, I'll just uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tom Sari. I work as a medical advisor for Tieto. Uh, my background is actually in general practice, but currently I work at uh, Turku University Hospital in the anesthesiologic ward, more specifically actually in electroconvulsive therapy right now. So uh, I usually say that uh, my job is to drink coffee and uh, press a button to reboot people. So very, very similar to IT work. Yes, and uh, my name is Karl Levor, and I've been working now three years with uh, OpenHR implementations in our company, and, and my current role is about release train architects with our clinical and OpenHR solutions. And today's agenda is a bit of a... Um, first, we'll start since this is the first time we're attending into these days. We're just first going to go through that who we are, what we're doing, and how we're doing, and then in the end, we also have a live demonstration of, of something that... It's currently functional and running on top of OpenEHR. So our the other healthcare consists of 600 people, and we have people in the Nordics, Poland, and India, and we're developing life care solutions in close cooperation between our customers and and of course, like you can see, that our customers are like primary care, secondary delta, uh, dental, and even private care providers in the Nordic countries. And with our offering here is that it's nice that we have had a lot of discussions about these ecosystem ideologies, and that is exactly what we are hitting here, that with our global focus, we have this healthcare IT backbone, and, and with that, we are focusing really heavily on, on the open edge side. And uh, then on top of that, we have this uh, professional services and consultancy about trainings, deployments, and nowadays even open edge modeling side from that, so there will be close cooperation of like, what kind of templates we would like to create with the customers, since those are, as already mentioned, use case specific and really specific to certain organizations. And then there are also different vertical solutions like invoicing and business intelligence. Um, but then let's hit a bit of uh, the technology that kind of enables us to move this way. And uh, in here we have, of course, microservice services used as part of kind of microarchitecture, and you can see some of the technologies that we are using on the on the left side. And then we have obviously the event-driven and data-driven architecture, and there you can once again see that OpenEHR plays a major role in that. And in that in addition to that, we are using this continuous integration with all the confidence levels automation, with the UI testing and and test automation. But then we're here also to discuss about our open EHR journey. And since we've been in the healthcare industry for a bit over 40 years now, so we have a bit of a monolith monolithic EHR in place, and now we're converging to, to the postmodern EHR. Tom. Sure. Uh, I'll just uh, give you a brief look at uh, our system. It's based on the, the better open EHR platform. And uh, here on our slide, we have uh, just a few examples of, of the modules we're building, the clinical system, systems on top of the OpenEHR platform. Uh, and of course, within th these modules, there are sub-modules and so forth. Uh, but the backbone is the OpenEHR pla platform, which handles the data entry and data reuse, the storing of the data. And for example, that allows us to, to build clinical dashboards based on needs, roles, and, for example, diagnosis-specific dashboards, just to give really summarized views, views of the data. Uh, it allows us to integrate uh, much more advanced clinical decision support systems based on this data, uh, which connects to the task planning. And uh, for, for today's, today's demo, we're actually going to look at one of our uh, modules that's currently in, in use by our customers. Uh, it relates to the observations and, and, and specifically uh, childhood growth, growth uh, graphing and uh, monitoring the, the growth in children. So here's uh, for our live demo. I'll have to use this laptop here.
There, we'll jump into the app. All right, so our patient is, is Alice Kingsley. She is a, a six-year-old female, and we have uh, inputted a minimum data set of, of uh, values of her height, weight, and so forth. And uh, for example, here we can uh, just have a look at, at uh, her weight. We can zoom in on the relevant data. We can add BME, BMI, body mass index values, uh, which are based on reference values from the population models. Uh, they're actually quite new from the year 2011 by Dunkel. And we can also add, add other data, for example, uh, her target height, which is, which is based on, on her parents' height. Uh, we can have a, have a closer look at, at the development in her weight, weight here, and also, also we can look at her early development, which we see has, has been under what we would call normal, normal growth charts, and our software supports uh, editing that data. For example, uh, we know that she was, she was born premature, so we can just quickly correct, correct uh, for that one. And then, then we can easily see that, that based on the, on the corrections, her growth actually has been quite normal. So this allows us easily to edit the data to fit the, fit the scenario. Uh, we can look at the same data in, in table format. It uh, allows us to, to see all the different different inputs uh, on, based on her age. We can uh, quickly analyze that data. This is also ba based on actually quite complex mathematical patterns. And uh, we can uh, quickly, quickly see that, that uh, her growth has, has increased at a certain point, point in time. And then we can also compare it to the population data and see how common is, is this type of, of growth increase. Uh, then we also have, have this uh, static data, which we, we only need to fill in once. So basically, her, her birth height, weight, hair circumference, uh, the information about her parents, and so on. So this data only needs to be entered once, and it's always visible. All right, uh, then we could jump into jump into adding, adding some, some new data. And let's see uh, if, if Alice, Alice is swapped over to a mushroom-based diet and, and then add some like, absurd length, uh, ten, 10 feet pops to mind. And, and then we'll just, just add, add her weight, weight as well here and see what happens. So yeah, now we have entered entered the new data that is that is automatically automatically analyzed. We can have a look look at the data. It didn't accept my input probably because it was so absurd. Let's try try that again. Oh yeah, now now it accepted, and then we can see it. It's four standard deviations above above something that's normal. So it's it's. Uh, immediately highlighted that the, this data probably doesn't, doesn't make sense. And then we can also see in the summary page that, that she, is, she is abnormally tall. And the similar stature is encountering less than half a percent of, of similar children. So, so actually, that uh, is easily, easily seen as probably abnormal data. And then we'll just, just have to uh, go here and correct it to something something that makes more sense. All right, um, I'll just see that the, the values are are much more more likely right now, and then uh, I'll just give you a, a quick example how the data is shared between modules. For example, this is this is our our journal app, and it also features the, the same, 
same measurements we just just entered, so it's automatically shared between between modules and documented in the journal. Then I'll just jump jump back into our slides, and here here I'll just just show you. show you, for example, the, the rules we had to use previously to, to see what is a normal growth of a child. And, and this is the simplified version. version. So you could see uh, how much time is saved by, by using a, a software to automatically do the analysis for, for the pediatrician. And maybe here it's also to say that this is kind of one of the benefits that if we use like structural data that we can do these automatic calculations with the software. And then that saves time, times from the clinicians. And in the demonstration, you saw this kind of an entry form which we entered. The idea is that we use the same application to enter the data for all the kind of the systems. Of course, there are some variances there, but the idea is that you only enter the data once, and you're, you are able to use it anywhere in the system or with third parties. And that's what, that was our presentation. Thank you. And if you have any questions. Thanks both. We have some questions. We have a little time. We're making up time nicely. So you'll have plenty of time to network at lunchtime. Do you have any questions for these guys? Mike? Um, um, thanks for that. And uh, I, I, I think what's interesting is um, you, you seem to have an existence across the whole Nordic um, healthcare market. I don't like calling healthcare a market, but it is what it is. Um, so it's just, I was wondering if you also have to deal with the kind of transformations that, you know, just we've been discussing, um, how prevalent, especially the big vendors, like the Sonas and the Epics and the old scripts um, in, in Northern Europe, um, do you think you, you're, going to, you, you're dealing with the integrations more compared to UK and rest of Europe or less? I think like, uh, well, it has been like said earlier in today that there is a kind of a lot of history in the Nordics with the healthcare. So there's a lot of data that has been like previously collected. So yes, there is some data migration and integrations that need to be done and, and kind of glad idea that we have this HL7 and like especially the HL7 V2 standard is something that is really popular there. And then that is kind of the get-go standard at the moment for that kind of communication. But when it goes to data migration, then it's always a bit tricky because it depends on, on, the, on the kind of the system that has been previously used by the customer. That Has that been how monolithic, how much of history there is? So yes, I, I see that this is a challenge. And in some of the cases, we have done data migrations, and it works really nicely. But then it's again the, the thing that how much of the data we can actually persist, or are we losing some of it? So that's why like in, in one of our solutions, we have done it so that we are able to, to view the legacy data but also to, to migrate the data to newer, a newer format so that we can, on side by side, we can see the legacy, the old data, and also the national archive data, which we have in Finland, for example. So one application to kind of contain all of it. So then it's just about that, what is feasible to be transferred in the structural format. Any other questions? If a patient from a Tieto using hospital were to visit Taunton, which uses another open air based system uh, with a medication record, how much work is required for those medication records to be made interoperable? A lot. Let's say that <laughs> medication is one of the trickiest domain, I would say, when it comes to the, the data side. And there's also like a constant kind of evolving on that area that how should the data actually look like and then we need to see that what does the open data data formats already present to us and there we there's a lot of let's say national specifications that in Finland the medication looks like this of course there are common things but then it's really hard to see have like an international standard for that that's really tricky mm -hmm. so I'd say that it's really hard yeah I'd, I'd Echo that. I'm, I currently have, I'm not sure if pleasure is the right word, but I'm working on the UNA Finnish yeah. national system. So I've also worked on the 
the, the medication models uh, for, that are used in Taunton and in our next speaker's Prashenshi, they all use the same, same, same medication models. But, but this is exactly true. Everything is somewhat localized because there's different prescribing practice, there's different prescribing terminologies. You know, the drug terminologies are different. So I think we're getting closer and closer all the time, but it's, it, you know, it's not plug and play anywhere yet. But we've done a pretty good job. I mean, the same medication models are underpinning all of these systems around the world. David? So, Mike here. So it's down here. here. Uh, David, just put your hand up again. Yeah. Okay, thank, you. <coughs> thank you. Very, very, very interesting presentation. Um, I'm sort of aware, and, and, and seeing your website, etc., your focus in Finland on integration between hospital and social care, mm. uh, health and social care. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, can you say a little bit about how that's going to play out in the context of this journey that you're on in, in relation to building open air into the core of your products and services? Yeah, that's a good question. There has been like a lot of publicity around the shows, like the welfare healthcare, um, cooperative systems, and uh, systems that would actually discuss with each other, and, and we are actually using kind of open air as a base there. Yes, there are not, not any international art types for the welfare systems, but we have rather good specification from the SOSMETA from where we have these templates which we can kind of convert to, to follow the open HR model. So then we can reuse a lot of our things and so that they are already kind of working together. So that, of course, requires that we would have like patient master indexes or, or kind of customer master indexes so that we can link the data that, that this is the same person may that be in the welfare side or in the, in the healthcare side. So that kind of thing is, is required to do, but I see that welfare will, uh, the kind of the open HR is something that we can utilize to, to combine these different solutions into one. So I really see high hopes on that. Yeah, and that's from a technical perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. From a practical perspective, we're still missing a lot of the legislation to actually allow us to combine everything in, in the same mm -hmm. system so that that uh, people, uh, workers in welfare can have a look at the, all the data they need to do their work, uh, and then also for doctors to be able to look at the welfare data. So that's uh, a lot of political processes still yeah. going on, and uh, how we actually combine those two. Thank you. Thanks very much both. Okay.